and I'm really loud. That's creeping me out. Uh, see, I've already forgotten what I was going to say. Okay, um, I'm giving a talk basically on sort of advanced and uh, unethical uses of Django. Um, I'm, I've kind of pitched it sort of for advanced users, but so beginning, beginning users, if, you, if you're kind of familiar with Django, you're going to be okay. If you haven't used Django before, I'm kind of skipping over the basic stuff. Um, so it might, you might be better off at the other talk. And if you're an advanced user of Django, you're going to be appalled at what I've done. And you're probably better off in the, in the other talk. Um, basically, there's no good reason for any of you to be here at all. Um, yeah. So some background on what I did. I was hired by Catalyst for a project which didn't get past the design stages, unfortunately. But it was a project for a reasonably well-known client, which was taking a large desktop application that they had and retrofitting it to turn it into a cloud app. Um, the database that it used was an embedded MySQL database. Um, it was locked into MySQL version 4.1, which is a little bit painful. Yeah, I heard that. Um, I wasn't allowed to change, I wasn't allowed to upgrade the version. Um, I was explicitly denied the ability to alter the schema in any way, shape, or form. I had to somehow take a single user database and turn it into a cloud database without changing the schema because it actually had to, had to remain compatible with their um, current existing infrastructure. Um, the infrastructure had a limited permissions model. It wasn't really designed for web users. Um, I'm going to say I'm a lot. I've got to prevent myself from doing that. Basically, as you can start to see, it was not designed in a web context terribly well. It was, it's one of those things where the database clearly had evolved for years. The product is a good 10 or 15 years old. Um, it had evolved over time. Everything that was in this database was there for really good reasons at the time, but a lot of them were not terribly well adapted to what they now wanted to evolve it to do. Um, And I get to actually zoom out, because this is just the number of things that were weird about the database. It wasn't just one database. It was seven databases. It wasn't just seven databases, because they wanted to be able to shard it out to different customers. So each customer would end up going to a different set of seven databases. Um, OK, what I'm going to go through in this talk is how Django can be used to interact with a legacy database. They have functionality in there for it. Um, the Django RM is honestly a lot of fun to use. It's brilliant. But um, where are we? Sorry, give me a moment. Ah, I'm losing everything. OK, I'm back. Um, no, I'm not. Hello. OK, so. Sorry, what I'm going to cover. Django's database inspection capabilities. It's basically default way of taking the current database and generating the schema for it for the model's interface. Um, how to deal with non-standard data types. So Django's object relational model is designed for compatibility between how many different database types? It supports MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQLite, um, and so it's actually limited to the features that are common between all of them, um, which is actually a bit tricky 
when you're dealing with something that was designed specifically for one database all along, MySQL in this case. Um, I'm going to be covering creepy, terrible, dreadful things you can do with Django's admin interface, which are actually kind of fun. I'm looking forward to getting onto that. Um, how to do multiple database routing, how to route your query to the database that you need it to go to when you don't actually know which one it needs to go to because you don't know how many databases you have. Um, severe abuse of that. Django's database routers are really, really cool, and I cheated with them. Um, and then finally, what I'm going to cover is forcing Django to do something that it wasn't designed to do at all, and the terrible, terrible consequences of doing that. Um, and you're going to hate me. Is there, are there any, is there, are there, is there anyone here who's actually a Django developer? Someone who's committed to Django? You know how I kind of, oh, okay, cool. Not, not someone who's actually a core committer on Django. Cool, because I froze up before, but if there was actually Django developers here, I would freak out and run away because I think they would probably lynch me at the end of this. Okay. So I had a database that I didn't actually know a hell of a lot about. Sorry? Say again? Zoom back. Zoom back. Ah, yes, of course. I did that very intentionally. Is that, that's probably a good one. Okay. Um, it, right from the start, Django has had this thing called InspectDB, which you just set up the database that you want it to talk to, and it will generate for you a models.py. It'll generate for you a complete set of models that, in theory, you can use to interface with your database. But I'm not too sure if it's really been updated in the last several years, so it doesn't take advantage of a lot of features that Django has. Um, let's take a look at an example output of it. Um, okay, those comments at the far right are basically just saying the same thing, so I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, this is giving you an example from one table um, in this database, which had maybe about 100 tables. But um, this is the sort of thing that the Django Inspect DB will put out. And it's a usable model, but there's a couple issues with the way it generates things. Um, I don't have any foreign key examples in this table. Um, but one of the things that, one of the problems with the Inspect DB is that when you're using it to point to foreign keys, it doesn't wrap them in quotes. These days with Django, you can wrap the thing that your, the model that your foreign key is pointing to in quotes, and that way it doesn't need to worry about the order of the models in the models.py file. Um, that's been a feature for a very long time now, like since 0 0.9, I think, but the inspect DB doesn't actually do that. So one of the things that it explicitly tells you at the top of the file is, we've generated your schemas, now you have to reorder them all around so that the one that is referring to a foreign key comes below the one that it's referring to. Um, otherwise, it will go, this model hasn't been defined. Um, one of the other issues with the inspect DB function is if it's any non-standard data type, if it's a Django data type, if it's a, a, a data type that Django doesn't recognize, it just calls it a text field. Um, that includes enumerations, blobs, images, uh, arrays, anything that is a data by, database column type that Django doesn't recognize, it just calls it a text field. And that actually, you can get away with that a lot of the time, but it doesn't work for things where you would expect maybe, it wouldn't work for an array definition in Postgres because it, the SQL statements are a strange syntax that I don't think the Django ORM will handle at all at the moment. Um, let's see. Yeah, covered that. If the database doesn't have a primary key, Django does not complain, and it will bite you for it later. Um, and that also includes if Django, if the database has a composite key. The two, the, the biggest limitation of the Django ORM that I found in everything that I did was the Django ORM, and most ORMs in general, 
absolutely require you to have a primary key in your table. Um, in, I think, SQL Alchemy's case, it handles composite keys. Does anyone know if that's true? Yeah, so does Stolen. Yep. Django does not. Django requires at least one field in every database table that it can pretend is a primary key. It doesn't have to be a primary key, but it has to be able to pretend that it is one. Otherwise, so any unique, any unique column will do. Uh, but we'll get onto that later in the talk because that's where things got really, really ugly. Um, dealing with non-standard data types. So this database that I was working with had a number of things in it which Django, by default, doesn't know how to handle. Um, as I said before, it's basically because the Django ORM is limited to the subset of things that every database that Django supports can do, uh, unless you're using some of the special exceptions like GeoDjango, maybe? Um, I've never used that, but I expect it's using proper geo types. Um, so you're limited to numbers and text and variations of numbers and text and that sort of thing. Um, but the good news is you've got a hell of a lot of flexibility in creating customized fields for Django. And when you're dealing with a legacy database, that makes it a lot of use because when you're dealing with a legacy database, you don't care about database cross-compatibility. You only care about getting the ORM to work with your database. My database was a big old MySQL thing. I didn't care about keeping it cross-compatible with Postgres because that's not what it's for. I didn't need to be able to generate my schema using Django's SyncDB into SQLite or Postgres because I already have my database and I've just got to talk to it. That means that you can do a lot of customization specifically for your database to make life a lot easier for you. You can just go completely nuts. This is an example of a Django customized field. Now, I didn't write this one. This one actually came from Stack Overflow. Um, actually, one thing that I've discovered about working with Django is that Stack Overflow does by far most of your work for you. It's really great. If you ever have to do anything in Django, just look it up. Someone's already done it on Stack Overflow. Copy and paste their code, and you're great. Um, MySQL enumer enumerations are a good example of the first type of database column that Django doesn't support off the bat, but actually supports by default pretty well anyway, because if you treat it like a text, a text field, which is what Django identifies it as, with InspectDB, it most of the time just works. Um, in any event, if you want to be able to customize them more, you can create a custom database field, a custom, I have to be careful with my terminology because there's form fields and database fields, and this is a custom database field, and it's really just making Django treat the SQL as if it were, or presenting it to the user on the Django side as if it were a choice field. Because a choice field in Django is actually just a text field, but the interface gives you options. Um, so you limit yourself to certain selections. What this is actually doing that's a little bit more special is making it so that when you create that database table, if you were using SyncDB, um, by providing the DB type, to your enumerated field, it's actually giving the instruction as to what the SQL looks like to create that column in the database. So this is an example of something that's not necessarily useful if you've already got your legacy database created, but it is an example of a customized field that scraps the database cross-compatibility in favor of just making things work better for you. Now, I used database custom fields a lot for some pretty weird things that were happening in my database. I'm just going to find my water bottle. Um, I had one of those databases that clearly came from previous ways of doing things, and one of those previous ways of doing things was XML for everything everywhere. Um, later in my talk, I will be telling you about the tables where I have whole gigabytes of tables where there was just a primary key and a chunk of XML. You know, that sort of thing. It's always fun. In this case, actually in all these cases, 
the XML was terminated by a null character. So all of my strings were ending with null characters, which was absolutely fundamentally essential to, for the operation of the code of the desktop application, but was actually not very useful in a web context. Um, the Django admin interface doesn't really like it when it pre-populates your fields with null characters. I don't really know what the web standard issue is here, but I'm pretty sure you're not really allowed to submit null characters in posts, and you're not really given much leeway in displaying them on web pages as well. Uh, they all got converted to the UTF-8 character for we don't know what this character is. Which is like a little skull and crossbones thing, I think. It was, it was interesting. It took me a little while to work out actually what was going on. Okay, now this is a slightly more complex example of a Django customized field, but the only two functions here that are particularly interesting are to Python and get prep value. Now, what I'm doing here is I decided early on that the last thing I ever wanted to do again was have to remember to put a null character in somehow when I'm processing my forms or inserting XML into the database or taking it out. The, putting in a, a Django customized field here meant that that was all happening on the database layer and I didn't have to think about it anymore at all. So the to, Pyth the to Python method there, its job is to convert whatever is in the database to the format that you want to present it to the person who's using the ORM. If the person with the ORM says, give me the XML from this field, you can, it, what actually happens is it, it gets run through the toPython method. So in this case, if the, fee, if the column was empty, I'm just returning the empty column. Now, what you'll notice there is that it's actually checking to make sure that the null character is there and if the null character is there at the very end, then it's, remove, it's returning it without the null character. That, you actually have to do that because the toPython method gets fed both the clean and unclean data. You don't actually know whether it's going to receive the data directly from the database or from the user. And either way, it has to handle it correctly. It has to be, so it has to handle the XML if the XML doesn't have the null character, and it has to handle the XML if it does have the null character. So you have the extra check there. Um, basically, that's the one that yeah goes from the database to the user, and then the get prep value is the opposite. It does the exact same thing in reverse. It could receive either something that came directly from the database, or it could receive something from the user, for example, from the admin inter interface, and it has to work out for itself whether to add the null character and then return the, null, return the piece of XML with the null character appended. Basically, the advantage of this is once this is implemented and once I have this in my models as the definition of my fields that had XML in them, I never had to think about the null character again. It was taken care of for me. So it's basically about inserting into the abstraction layer of the ORM, because that's what an ORM is, it's just an abstraction layer over your database, the right place to solve the problem so you just don't have to think about it again. I had a fun thing in this database where every table had a primary key, and that primary key was not an integer, which is what we like to think primary keys usually are, or something useful. It was an 18-byte binary blob. This made me sad, but it was a lot of fun once I worked out what to do because, oh yeah, by the way, if you have an 18 character binary blob as a primary key and you try and use that in the Django admin interface and your URL has a binary splodge in, in the address bar, your browser's behavior is undefined. Um, I, I, I think it didn't work. In any event, it was really quite ugly, but again, here we just have, again, the same two methods are the ones that are interesting, the toPython and the getPrepValue. And in one case, in toPython, I'm just taking my binary blob and I'm converting it to a hexadecimal value. And I'm even sticking hyphens into it to make it a bit more readable. Um, what you'll, if, you're, if you're sharp, what you'll spot is that the 18-byte binary value actually matched 
a, a GUI to GUID, a global unique identifier, is that what it stands for? Um, with a two byte suffix or prefix, I can't remember. Um, but it was a binary blob with extras, which was supposed to be a globally unique chunk of stuff. And that works really great until you're actually trying to type it out in human readable form. And this solves that problem. Same deal, basically, now in address bars, in the admin interface, and when you're dealing it with it in your view code, you end up with human readable stuff. I actually have to move a lot faster. So, oh yeah, that's just the same two methods. Dealing with XML in a web context, I needed to be able to edit this XML easily. But I didn't want to have to do it every time in the views. I wanted to get all that into the ORM, basically so that I could treat it as an API, as opposed to having to manipulate the XML and knowing about the weird stuff going on in the database behind my back. Django's admin interface, the way it usually works is it generates a form for your model, which gives you form fields that let you edit the values in your database row, and then put those back into the database, take them out, whatever. But like everything in Django, it's infinitely configurable, and you can pass it whatever class you want as the form that goes into your admin field. I mean, into your admin inter interface. You can give it whatever form. It doesn't have to be a form that's particularly related to the database model. So, what I did was I took this database field, which that's the entire model. It was an ID and it was a chunk of config. And this was my new form field. And what's actually happening here, I beg you, please don't actually try and read all that and understand it because I probably screwed up the transcription somewhere anyway. But what's happening is I'm taking the chunk of XML and I am decomposing that into multiple form fields where each of those is editable and pulling the values directly out of the XML so that you can edit them in the Django interface. The result of that, sorry, these, these fields that you see there, name, start date, end date, available in time zone, were all actually just tags in the XML. But now what you can do is you can edit them directly in the admin interface. And then when you hit save on your admin page, it recomposes that back into the XML, sticks that XML back into the XML field, saves that to the database. And then in saving that to the database, it's even adding the null character to the end so that I don't even have to think about that. Um, that was a lot of fun to do, and it's a hideous clutch, and I hope none of you ever have to do it, and I'll bet some of you will. Because if anyone's having to work with a legacy database at some point, they're gonna see that their legacy database has a chunk of, oh, I guess it's probably JSON these days, but. What do you do if your XML file isn't actually XML, but two XML files where one of the entities let me explain. The open brace, the open bracket, the open angle bracket was replaced with its entity. So what is it? And GT for greater than. Um, but they didn't do the same thing for the closing one. And you're actually allowed to do that. Like you're actually allowed to stick XML in XML if you change the, if you change two entities, the open bracket, the closed bracket, and the ampersand. But if you don't, it's, it's malformed XML. So I needed to stick malformed XML into XML, having rebuilt it from the admin interface. I'm not gonna show you the code that did that. It was kind of similar to what you saw before, except worse, much worse. Okay. Database routing is a new feature in Django. It's from about version 1.1, was it 1.1 or 1.2? One of those. The basic idea is you have a bunch of methods, you have a database router, and you can, given a model, whenever it tries to execute a piece of SQL, it asks the database router, for this model, what database do I want to talk to? And a lot of the time, it doesn't have a lot of clues as to what context that's actually happening in. 
the hints that you see in that. Okay, sorry, this piece of code is actually directly from the Django documentation. Um, the hints varies depending on what the method is that you're looking at. But as you can see, it's a very simple class, which basically just says, what is the database that I want to read from when I've been past this model? Now, what I had to deal with was a set of seven databases, basically just to set up separate different sets of schemas. Um, and the models that I was given, sorry, the, the users were to be sharded between different sets of databases. So we would have to know what server they were going to and which of the seven databases they were going to. The only way we would know that is by looking at the user and seeing what database they were allocated. Who's used global variables in Python? Yeah, basically a global variable in Python has actually just got module scope. So if you want to, you can store things in a global context, but it's a bad idea. And you can do it, but you don't want to because it'll break everything. The reason it'll break everything is because if it's global, then it will actually be global for multiple requests. So if two users are accessing the database at the same time, they'll access the same global variable, and then bad things will happen. What you actually need to do is separate it out by thread. So you have a thread variable, which is unique just to that thread. What I had to do was I had to work out who the user was at the start of the request and what database they were supposed to access, and then configure the database router to route them to that database without interfering with everyone else. Who's used, the, who's used Django middleware? The Django middleware stack, basically, at the start of the request, it works from the bottom and runs a function and goes up to the top, and then at the end of the request, the middleware executes again in reverse order. What's going on here, this is where people will start to get angry with me, what's going on here is I have at the very top of the request stack a piece of middleware which is looking up who the user is, finding out what database they're supposed to be routed to, setting a global variable, a thread global variable, so a thread local variable, to tell the rest of the request what database that person is supposed to be routed to, and then leaving that there for the duration of the request. And then my database router had to look at that global variable every time there was a database query, and then send them to the correct database. Now, the real advantage of that was it meant that the admin interface works transparently. I'm running out of time. I am actually out of time. And I got to the best part. Oh, well. Sure, OK. Database routing, that was pretty ugly. But this was the thing that was truly horrifying. And I apologize in advance. OK, Django doesn't support tables without a primary key. There's, it just doesn't work correctly without a unique field that it can absolutely be confident is unique. But what you can do is lie. You can go into the models and you can say, this field's my primary key, honest. And it'll go, OK, that's your primary key. I'll treat it as your primary key. And everything will be fine, except it's not fine at all. So just to back up, if you're ever in this situation, just add a primary key to your database. Um, it's real easy. You can just add any kind of thing. Doesn't matter what it is. Make sure it's unique. It will save you quite a lot of pain. Um, and that's what I did, and it worked fine for a month, and everything was hunky-dory until the client came back to me and said, no, actually, you're not allowed to change the schema in any way, shape, or form. And so I had to come up with a new way of doing it. I had to take, for example, this was a model that was a bit weird. It's a kind of a tree structure. It has parents and children, and it doesn't have a specific unique primary key because it, the parent might have been this thing called a displayable, or it might have been this thing you see called a config, and then the children might be different as well. So there was any combination of primary keys that it could be. 
I just lie and say, oh, don't worry about it. That's a primary key. That's cool. Displayable is a primary key. Now, you'll notice at the bottom there, there's this unique together thing. That is a Django feature, which is actually really useful, and it approximates a part of this. It won't let you save an object to the database unless those three conditions um, or any of those sets of conditions are unique. So it's like a unique constraint, but it's not the same as a composite key. Django doesn't recognize that those things could be a key of their own right. Why would you want to do this? Because it really is useful to actually use the ORM directly. Um, now, when you're pulling objects out of an ORM, you usually do it by primary key. And I've obviously, my primary key is a lie, so I can't do that. But I can still get at them from their relationship to other things. I can go, for this displayable, give me all of its children, and I'll get the right objects. And that's what I gained from doing this. Um, what you've lost, you can't, like I just said, you can't pull objects directly out of the database uh, individually, and the admin interface is hosed. The admin interface expects you to have a primary key. It can, it, you don't control the queries that the admin interface uses. I was able to mess with the forms, but you can't mess with the actual queries that it's using to pull out individual objects. So it's just out of reach if you're going to cheat this much. And then there's the deletion problem. So let's say you have an object and you've lied about its primary key, and then you tell it to delete that object. This is the SQL that it'll give you. Assuming, this, let's just say that it was one of those times when the parent object was actually something different. <laughs> now, I can't, give you, I can't give you too many details about what this database actually was, but I will tell you that I deleted New Zealand and I was embarrassed. <laughs> You've got to stop Django from actually doing the things that it's sure it should be allowed to do, and you mustn't let it do. You can't let it delete, because it always deletes using the primary key, and the primary key isn't primary, and terrible things happen. So my first try of that was to override the save and delete method. And that actually works when you're dealing with individual objects. You, you, you have really good flexibility on whether you save and delete um, and how you do so, until you have a cascading delete issue. So here. Django, when you delete an object and it has other objects that are pointing to it, it will do a cascade delete by default. And it doesn't use the database's cascading function because different databases implement it different ways. It has its own collectors which actually search through, find all the objects, and delete them. So you've got to prevent that from happening. And I was really pleased to discover that there's this thing called onDelete where you can actually define the behavior of the cascading delete that Django usually does. And there's a bunch of options for it. There's do nothing, there's set to null, there's cascade, which is the default. It usually does just go and delete the entire tree of objects. Um, there's set to a value. There's even one that you can pass in a callable, and the callable will set the value. I think this feature was um, Django 1.2 was when that actually finally happened. And if that wasn't there, then things would have gotten really ugly. And that almost solved my problems until... This is the last slide. Yeah, okay. Until I had query sets that delete, because query sets will just do it based on a where clause, and then you're still ending up deleting everything, and everything goes nuts. So the final thing that I had to do to actually prevent it from happening was take advantage of Django's signal mechanism, hook into it so that every time it tried to delete anything, it would call this function and say, no, you can't delete that. And what it's actually doing is, you'll see it's checking, am I one of these types? If so, don't let me delete. And if I'm some, whatever type I am, if I have this function called delete dependent rows, then call that instead. And what that was actually doing was dropping to raw SQL and doing the deletion of the child things for me. Okay, so why would you actually want to go to all this trouble? And really the answer is because you want to keep the weird database stuff abstracted out. If I got this right, if I kept all of this evil, all of this horrible stuff basically in my model's pie, then the person who's writing the views and the person who's actually writing the rest of it doesn't have to think about how horrible 
the database actually is and the sins I had to commit to make it easier for them. And since that person was future me, I, I didn't want to torture him any further than he already had. The poor bastard had it rough. Um, ugliness in code is sometimes necessary. Try to avoid it when you can. And if you can't avoid it, keep it contained. If you can do that, then your abstraction layer is kind of protecting you from yourself. Um, thanks a lot for your time. Sorry, I had to rush the end of it. <laughs> <laughs>